everybody. Um, thanks, Greg, for the invitation to be here. Um, I, I guess in keeping with the, the last two um, talks, I'll say that the medium here actually is the physical city. This talk is about what the built environment, the thing, you know, the, one of the uh, things that human beings have been building, certainly one of the most complex things that people have been building for the longest time, cities, can teach us as we're in this, you know, very young world of, of digital cities and, and virtual cities. So let's see, you have to stand about here. Um, I work for the city of Chicago. Um, this role did not exist uh, in previous administrations, and it's really driven by um, the idea that um, data-driven decision-making is um, one of the best ways uh, to run a city government. And you do that um, by gathering the vital signs um, from the environment, um, data about the systems that make up the system that is a city, so infrastructure, transportation, um, public safety, those sorts of things. So um, we're doing a lot of that. Um, we have a data portal, um, hundreds and hundreds of data sets on there that are updated nightly about all the things that describe the health or the illness um, of a portion of a city. Um, let's see here. Um, th these are visualized in a variety of different ways. This is um, average uh, uh, traffic volumes uh, at a given point in the day, city of Chicago. Um, we're also looking at um, social media as a kind of the ultimate feed, right? Uh, you can consider Twitter and Facebook and other forms of Foursquare, too, actually. There'll be a big announcement tomorrow about that uh, in Chicago. Um, as the data feed, the vital sign that is the residents and, and visitors of the city. So in this case, what we've got here is um, we're working on automated ways of isolating um, comments and geolocated comments um, in the city to automatically trigger service requests, or at the very least, inspections. So for instance, the Chicago Department of Public Health um, is constantly, uh, has automated the way of looking for the combination food plus poisoning. And when they see that, and if they see enough of those in a certain area, they'll dispatch an inspector. Now that's very crude. Um, it's not at all uh, granular enough. But this is the beginning of analyzing. Um, it's kind of the equivalent, uh, the equivalent of you know, you're measuring the vital statistics of a patient, but you're also asking that patient how he or she feels. This is the corollary to that. Now, the data is fine. Um, we spent the first 100 days actually getting up to speed or, 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 or catching up to other cities that were collecting um, data. But what we're, the, the, the point we're in now here is moving that data to action. And there's a couple of ways that we're doing that. Um, one is an application development competition. This is called Apps for Metro Chicago. Now, other cities have, uh, have done this, but really, this is more about community building than it is about app building. I mean, certainly, um, there are some cool apps that come out of this. I'll show you those. Um, the first round called the transportation round just ended, but really what this is about, I mean, there's almost an economic development piece to this, um, is, is bringing people together, designers, developers, urbanists, nonprofits, uh, into a community of hack days, ongoing hack days, to develop these apps, um, which um, can sustain business growth going forward. So for instance, uh, here's an app called Spot Hero. This is a pretty neat idea. It's for people in the city that own or rent uh, a parking space, so not a city parking space, but say something outside a condo, um, you can sublease that, you can sublet that, and make it available in you know, hour or two hour, three hour increments. So as someone who doesn't have a spot like this can drive around with their phone and see what spot's available and take it. Um, another one, here's chicagolobbyist.org. Oh, the, the key point uh, about that last one, and this one too, is this is built on top of open data. So when you hear about the open data movement, you often think about transparency and accountability. I mean, that's, that's why it gets the press. That's why politicians like it. But really, open data is, a, is a, a, almost a natural resource. It, it's certainly a public resource. The, 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 city, the people of the city create it by using the city, so it should be given back. Businesses can be built upon it. The, the weather industry is a $1.5 billion industry. Um, would not exist without the National Weather Service, which is essentially an open data organization. All the, app, all the transportation apps you see in the App Store are making people money, and it's based on top of open public data. Now, this is a bit different. This is based on lobbyist information in Chicago, and it's, a, it's basically a social network without the like and dislike button, although that's probably a good idea for who gives the most and, 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 and where's the lobbying data go, or money going in Chicago. Um, so if, if there are any Chicagoans in here, you know street sweeping happens. And this is just so radically uh, simple. Um, you put your address in. Um, this is all built on top of the city's open data. And then the night before, um, it gives you a text or emails you to move your car so you don't get a ticket. You know, 
Why was this not done before? So what I really want to talk about, though, is the, is the physical city. So we've got all this data. We've got these programs for creating applications from the data. But where it really matters and where the lessons are to be found is in the public way. And the public way is, for, for the definition here, the sidewalk, public plazas, um, you know, some of the vitalist areas of the public er uh, city. So you're seeing some examples of that here. You've got you know, signage, uh, digital signage in bus shelters. You've got uh, public bike share. Now, these aren't actually in Chicago right now, but they, both of those are coming. These we do have. You've probably heard about the parking meters in Chicago, and say what you will about how that deal happened. But from my perspective, that's 4,500 computers that are in every neighborhood of the city, um, network computers, I should say. We've got these big belly solar compactors, some of which are actually on the internet. Um, and then you've got, you know, what Greg was just talking about, you've got an entire populace of people carrying very sophisticated devices around. These are totally disarticulated. There's nothing about what you might call the digital public way that's connected together. Um, it is, in some ways, a lot like the public way in the 19th century. You've seen these photos of Chicago and other cities where it's absolute bedlam out on the street. And if you could visualize that from a digital standpoint, that's what it would look like now. See? Disconnected. You can be my stunt mouse. Okay. So, the more people living in cities now than ever before, this is a, this is a quickly growing stale statistic. But what um, a, a really interesting statistic, um, Adam Greenfield and others have noted from Gartner, is that they predict that actually this is from a couple years ago, but the, by this year, 20% of the non-video data on the internet will not come from people to people, but from devices itself. So this is the Internet of Things. And um, you, you know, another way to conceptualize that is you know, for every text messages um, that a, a pedestrian sends while she's walking on the sidewalk, um, the sidewalk itself is sending a quarter of that data. Right? And the city really is the locus of these interconnected sensors and systems and people as sensors. Um, it, is the, it is an Internet that is composed of things talking to one another and, or, or, or with the potential to talk to one, to one another. There we go. Okay, whoops. Okay, so this is a very simple bus sign, but this illustrates sort of conceptually this idea of in, uh, an internet-enabled city. This is a, a CTA bus sign. You may not have noticed that on the bottom of these signs, they have an SMS short code where you can text a number if you don't have a smartphone or something like that, and it'll give you a list of the upcoming buses. Now, the reason I really like this is this is a piece of public infrastructure that's essentially queryable. You're ask, I mean, you're actually sending it over the cell network, but in a sense, you're walking up to a piece of city infrastructure and asking it a question or interacting with it somehow. What if, um, what if every piece of city infrastructure was like that? The moving pieces, the fleet, um, as well as the city itself, was responsive and queryable. Now, there have been some experiments of this. Uh, Maynard, Texas is a, is a good one. It's a town just outside of um, Austin where they have QR codes on all of the city uh, sort of fleet. So you can walk up to a sort of a sanitation vehicle and get the, the schedule for, for that day. Or you can walk up to, to City Hall and basically interact with the, the public building. So we've got, we've got all this data coming in. And this is old graphic for, from IBM. Um, but it's it, the question and, and what we need to learn from the built environment is what should be the touch points of that in the physical environment? Because we're not going to be sitting in front of computers. The digital city uh, the digital public way is not sitting at a desktop computer. And I'd argue it's only partially uh, your, the mobile phone in your pocket. So we're thinking of things like this. Let's see here. Right, so um, this is uh, designed by Urban Scale um, in Helsinki. Um, very smart, uh, interactive, hyper-local um, signage, basically. But things that take all kinds of input, not just when's the next bus coming, but ambient data about the environment, um, hyperlocal information about what's, um, the, 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 what's closest to you at that point. Um, but there's another point about this, is that this is a public resource. You know, sort of like those old, the Parisian kiosks where you would just tack something up. It's different than, than interacting with it on, on your phone. It's, it's in the public way and responsive to things around it. So let's go back to an image that I had down here. This, this, this woman's walking down the sidewalk. She's doing all kinds of things at once. She's, she's texting. She's navigating the built environment, possibly even being stalked. Um, <laughs> what, this is interesting, an interesting moment because she is, you know, to put it another way, she's simultaneously navigating two, in, uh, two interfaces. 
One we don't think of as such very often. It's the skin of the built world, the sidewalk, the, the curb, the doors. Uh, something you're not taught, but that you can definitely see someone who knows how to do it and someone who doesn't. It's the difference between a native city dweller and, and a visitor. They just, you can tell by the way they walk down the sidewalk. So she's doing that. But she's also interacting with this interface that is the cell phone, um, you know, possibly, uh, possibly created in China. But the, the point is, those two communities of practice that design these two very complex interfaces, they don't talk. The urban planners, the architects, the UI designers, and the engineers, um, they're both engaged in city making, and yet they're, they're completely separate, and that's a real problem. So I'm going to talk very, very quickly about um, urban highways. Okay, so this is, this is something that came up after the, the Federal Interstate Highway Act. And what we've seen in the last 10 years or so is the effort to unmake them, um, in part. Um, Boston is a, is a prime example, but it's happening in other places. And I think, you know, often the internet is called, the, you know, where it was called the internet superhighway. It's it, digital divide um, is often referred to in terms of connectivity and, and um, uh, in, in ways that uh, you go back and read, the internet, inter, uh, interstate highway system was talked about. So let's, let's take a, a look at some of these examples here. Okay, so first is, I'll say unintended consequences accompany any design of a complex system. This is a lesson from architecture and urban planning that I think needs to be internalized by, by the designers of the digital city. So this is the old I-93 in Boston, okay, which has been buried in, in the big dig. Um, you can talk about all the kinds of, of, of consequences that this had. Um, the reason it was buried, you know, it, it, it you know, sort of segregated certain areas of the city. But one unintended consequence of that highway, which was so hated um, and, and eventually buried, is that it actually, it, it, it performed sort of a role of historic preservation. Um, the North End, you could argue, wouldn't be as sort of pristine, or at least one of the you know, top three Little Italy's in America, if it hadn't been essentially severed um, from the city f for all that time. This is an unintended consequence. Um, it, it, you know, it, 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 well, this is, this is a, a picture of the sort of vibrant sort of street level culture that was kind of uh, protected by, by that highway. So this is a quote from, from William Gibson, actually, which is really a, the follow on to the one that Greg um, gave. One of the things about the design of digital technologies in cities is you really do need to see what the street will do with it. Um, and, and I guess this is, this is the, the corollary to the, the lesson about unintended consequences. You, you really shouldn't even engage in the design process um, in trying to predict everything that's going to happen, but make it adaptable enough. This is, this, is the, this is the lesson of Twitter, right? No one was identifying a need to, to send a status update in 140 characters. The reason Twitter is so vital is that it was flexible enough to do things that the designers never, never intended. So throughput is not connectivity. This, this one's pretty, pretty easy to understand. Okay, so this is that, that street scene on Randolph that I, that I mentioned before. Um, so these were uh, early plans, um, for freeway routes. Basically what was happening here is that you were taking two totally different approaches to mobile connectivity. One was throughput based, um, and that's the interstate highways, basically um, sacrificing the um, connectivity from points A through Z for very fast connectivity points A through B. And this, this really was the opposite of the way um, that cities worked. And it was like this deliberate, deliberate blurring of connectivity and throughput um, that, that so many of the, the sort of bad effects of the interstate highway system uh, brought about. I mean, the grid system is, is one of the most effective ways um, of moving about, and it's very similar to the internet, right? I mean, cities, in some ways, are proto-internets in that, you know, in the, it, the internet, in a sense, you can get to any place from any place without having to take a single channel. Um, we know this is, is, is the way that a city grid works. I mean, you can't just teleport from one place to, to the next, but there are, it's redundant, right? This is what, why the internet was, was, was created. It was, it's a redundant network, and the grid is that way as well. So, you know, what was lost is the, the kind of street level um, uh, connectivity that, that, um, that, that multiple streets and multiple access um, could provide. So catastrophic failure is an opportunity. I mean, this one's especially, I guess, pertinent in the, in the current economic climate. But you remember when the um, Embarcadero Freeway collapsed 
I think it was 1989. Um, this is really interesting because people had been, I mean, it, 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 this freeway performed the same function sort of psychologically as the, um, as I-93 in that it, it separated the waterfront. And, um, you know, shop, there, there, were, there were some movements prior to this to tear it down, but um, business owners and shopkeepers didn't want that to happen. They thought that um, if, if it was torn down, no one would come. There would be no way to get there. Forgetting, of course, that, um, it, you know, that in, in earlier days, it was actually the um, multiple ways of getting to a, a point in a city that made a market um, so, so vital. So um, the question here was, uh, so it, it, it was torn down afterwards, um, and, and of course, the, the area did, did, did great. So there's another example of that, uh, which I'll get to in a second. So all change is system-wide change. So you may um, have heard of system dynamics. This, these are called causal loop diagrams, okay? Um, so basically, um, we've been doing this for, for cities. This is the city of Chicago. It was done at IBM as well. So you, you got a positive feedback loop and a negative feedback loop. So um, the positive feedback loop is more eggs leads to more chickens. The negative feedback loop is more chickens means more road crossings, which potentially leads to less chickens. And you know, when you can quantify this, um, and, and that you can actually do prediction about how a system will work. And this is a very simple one. Um, here's a bit more complicated one. So you add in hatch rates and weather and chicken health and things like farmer hunger. Um, and it, now, so imagine this, not for, not for chickens crossing the road, but just say people crossing the road, something like that. Um, it quickly looks like a bowl of spaghetti. It's the, I've described it as the realm of the hellishly complex. Um, but it is a way of looking at systemic um, implications of a single change. You know, remove this variable from the mix and you see what happens. And I think the big dig actually is, is a good example of that. I-93 is not there anymore, at least it's not there at, at street level, but the effects of it, psychologically, architecturally, I mean for several decades, Boston grew away from it. And you walk down the, the Rose Kennedy Greenway here, which is beautiful and lovely, but it certainly doesn't feel like that, that street from the from the North End, right? It, it, this is scar tissue in a way, right? Um, and and, and uh, attention to the systemic implications of a design point, um, not just the one little design point, I think it, it, is, it is incumbent upon the digital designers um, of, of, of the urban way uh, to understand that because we've got so many examples of it in the, in the real world. Um, here's an example of um, what I call urban scar tissue. This is, um, that's actually Wrigley Field up at the top. Let's see if I can get this to go. Hmm. Sorry about that. Actually, just tap the uh, space bar. Oh, there we go. Okay, so that, see that weird line that runs down like that? That's an old rail line that's not there anymore. It used to run right up to Wrigley, and the, the city has kind of filled in. Um, you can still see it aerially, but it's filled in with buildings and things like that. And in, in, in a sense, all, all urban tissue, if you want to say, is, 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 is scar tissue. It's, it's built upon what was, was there before. And so the question always is, you know, what are the larger implications of a change in the way that the big dig um, still sort of retains that um, psychological and architectural uh, gap in the city. So it's easy to confuse the use of a system with the need for a system. Um, some of you may, may remember the West Side Highway in New York City. It collapsed, ironically it collapsed because there was a, um, a city dump truck full of asphalt that, that collapsed it. Um, but you know, there was panic that um, all this traffic would flood now into Manhattan and it would be you know, horrible gridlock. That didn't happen. Um, it didn't happen, you know, because the grid itself was so flexible, and also some people just didn't drive. You know, this is, this is the idea that I do this every day, therefore I must do it. Um, and so it's the confusing the need um, with the usage of something itself, and the High Line is a great example of that in New York City, um, is, is the adaptability. Building something, not that the builders of the High Line thought that it would ever become this, but adaptive reuse. Um, uh, the, a, new, you know, a new need um, is met through adaptive reuse. And I think that's something that currently is not built into our digital interfaces um, in the city. 
So lastly, data alone is not sufficient for problem solving, but an involved community informed with data just might be. And this really is kind of underlying the way that the city of Chicago is going at things. And I would just tell a little story here. Um, a little while ago, I went to a community meeting. Um, if, if you know the city, this is the Western Avenue overpass at Belmont and Clybourne. Um, it's at the structural end of life. It needs to be either rebuilt or torn down because it's, it's, it's crumbling. So this is at the site, or, or just off to the side of the site, of what was at the time the largest amusement park in the world, um, Riverview Amusement Park, um, which is right at the river. It closed in, I believe, 1967. The reason that overpass was built um, was because it was uh, so congested. There was the Clybourne streetcar, um, uh, trolleys, people walking. Um, it, it, it was a, for, for safety. But in the intervening years, the environment itself has responded to it. These are the larger systemic changes um, to something that, let's say, you know, a, a streetscape that doesn't invite chance inquiry, doesn't really promote pedestrianism. It's really changed the area around it. So if you were to remove it, um, you'd still have the consequences of that design decision. Now, um, in this meeting, it was very interesting. Um, they, they brought, it, it was like science fair um, with posters. You had the engineering firm saying this is, will actually improve throughput if we tear the thing down because we'll have more space to work with and things like that. What was interesting, to, and as a sort of an urbanist, um, I completely agree with this. I consider it a blight. It's on the edge of my neighborhood. So I agree with that. But the actual, mo what, what struck me is the mode of engaging the public was this kind of decades old, here's what we have and here's what we're doing when we have all the data. You know, wh where's the data about um, the, the, the vehicle throughput? Where's the data on how this changing this intersection is going to change other intersections further down the line? And what makes this um, not just annoying, but really sort of intolerable in a city like Chicago is that we're swimming in data about traffic, about people, about, you know, it's generated from the bottom up through tweets and texts. It's captured in the street cameras and things like this. There's simply no reason why we can't design tools to bring people sort of into a closer relationship with the decision-making process, or at least the deliberation process, about something in the physical environment like this. You've got sites like C-Click Fix. I don't know if you've heard about this. This is kind of a distributed 311 service request. This takes, basically takes the act of caring about your neighborhood. There's a pothole here or a tree down here and allows anybody to see what the request is, what the status of it, and in some cases, allows the community to come together and solve that problem. Okay, so um, that's, that's what I mean about, like, it, the open data is one thing from a transparency perspective, but it also forms communities around it. Uh, every block, this is hyper-local news, basically, um, down to the block level, um, which was purchased by MSNBC just a couple years ago. Um, this, is one of the this was one of the first sites that gathered um, metrics at a, at a block level. City Forward, the project that Greg mentioned, this is um, a global data uh, aggregator for cities worldwide. Um, this permits the comparison of similar data sets across cities, which is a very gnarly problem in, in the sense that you know, land use in Hong Kong will never uh, be the same thing as land use in Kansas City or something like this, but there are dozens of, of cities in this for um, comparison. So back to the digital public way. Um, what we're doing in the city of Chicago is taking some, the lessons of the built environment. We are, we are doing, we are bringing the architects, people who don't know technology at all, people who have solved some of these problems about connectivity, about privacy, um, about the overlap between public and private and applying those lessons in building a connected digital public way so that all of those devices that you saw, the, all that network architecture, the parking meters and the bike sharing um, is, is open to use in the way that the public way is. So think of, of the sidewalk. The city permits businesses to extend out into it, permits people to do certain things in that area. Um, permit as a noun or permit as a verb um, the digital public way is not that way yet. So we, um, we are actively looking at the historical record for how to do this. And I wanted to just end with this. This is Chicago's version of the High Line. It's called the Bloomingdale Trail. It's a great example of adaptive reuse. Um, it's, it was a freight railway earthen, not, not uh, metal work like the High Line, but um, should be uh, a, basically a linear park in the next couple of years. And I use this as inspiration um, for adaptive reuse as we, we go about planning the digital city. Thank you very much.